I right now I'm okay. I don't know if I'll be able to stay on the whole time. Um, so do we want to hit um, pick on innocent little alt right rationals? Uh, because I do have somebody had sent me this uh, Twitter feed from the autopsy eighty seven Drucifer. Oh please um, go ahead. So he's talking to somebody called Nibusha. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and he says, they'll run with this while the Hillary leaks fade into obscurity. I think it'll hurt him. Shouldn't? No. But people are retards. And um, then someone called the conservative said, um, I'm the gorilla dicked nigga. I make dyke pussy wet. Donald Trump, like that was a, um, that was a quote from him, hashtag Trump tape, and he says, lol, I wish Trump had said that, I'd quit my job and volunteer for his campaign. So, <sighs> we're dealing with a lot of rationality. I think that's uh, our major point there. Um, yeah, just... <sighs> yeah, sometimes well, I weep for humanity. Yeah, the, um, well, I, I, think I love and hate our species sometimes. I think it's worth bearing in mind the difference between the kind of scum you get on the internet and the most people. I think most people viewing that tape will have been annoyed, and I think you will see a corresponding dip in the poll numbers from the already pathetically low level he's at. Mm. Well, certainly... And not, not just that, but I think... Okay. Sorry, I was just, uh, just going to say, I, I read a thing in the immediate aftermath saying that straight away they've now pulled hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of advertising that they were going to have in the, in key swings that i mean we're talking ohio florida north carolina the rest mm. um i think even the trump campaign are now basically accepting defeat yeah well certainly what makes this different is one he made a video where he said he was sorry if people were offended i don't know that he's ever said the words i'm and sorry together before <laughs> <laughs> True, but even even then, it was still a mealy mouthed load of old shite. It wasn't a proper apology. Oh, no. yeah, definitely. I mean, but it's the closest he's come. And then more importantly, he's just been shedding endorsements all day. Kelly Ayotte, um, Hugh Hewitt asked for him to step down. The third highest Republican in the Senate said he was unendorsing him. Paul Ryan disinvited him to event in an event in Wisconsin. Mike Pence also ended up not showing up. Mm -hmm. um, people were gonna Trump supporters were gonna stay around to heckle. Paul Ryan, and I think this is actually what might bring down the Republican Party, is if the establishment break away from Trump, the Trump supporters might go to the polls and vote for Trump, but not for the Republican establishment, their Senate candidate, their House candidate, and the Republicans in the first polls, um, and they won't vote for Trump, but they'll vote for their candidate, so they'll split within their own party. Mm. And um, maybe that will end up with the Democrats getting the Senate and the White House. Very possibly, because on it, actually Paul Ryan looks in significant amount of trouble in Wisconsin. Yeah, well, couldn't happen to a better guy. Um, I wanted to, to pull it back to sort of why I sort of brought these things up, the Amazing Atheist Sargon and um, uh, Autopsy 87, um, which is just this idea. One of the other things that Trump did recently that didn't get quite as much play but he was at a rally and he said all right everybody here who's not a christian raise your hand you know because he was talking so anybody who was not of the right religion had to raise their hand and then he's saying things like oh should we let them stay should we kick them out eh, i guess they can stay you know which between stuff like that between the way that he talks to the evangelical right between nominating someone like Mike Pence for his running mate, anybody who has just just a nonce of concern for atheism and how atheists are treated or for secularism should be dead set against this guy. And it, it really has, uh, <laughs> I don't know if they're just being foolish, right? Well, let's, or... let's call it what it is. They, they, they don't want a lady to be president. Yeah. You, can't, you can't have someone without a cock behind the fucking Oval Office desk. It would just be absurd to these people. It would, the world would crash and burn. So if I could perhaps bring together two things that are connected, one 
the way that people uh, talk to one another, and also somebody who has endorsed Trump, how TJ spoke to you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was, I mean, we knew, I, I think everyone knew he was going to be a jerk because that's kind of his thing. But mm. the way that he addressed you and also just the pure uh, sort of air, I want to say arrogance, I don't know, he was speaking down to you as if he was more of an authority on an issue that he'd done nothing on and you have actually in, in a career choice that you've worked in. Well, I, actually, um, just that's almost... And sorry. If I can finish, sorry, sorry, but he was, uh, I think that for him was the low point of, mm -hmm. of whatever he makes these, these response videos. Um, I, I Maybe he'll outdo himself, who knows. But really, I think that you deserve a lot of credit for going high when he goes low and you're forming this group. Um, and maybe if he actually pulls his thumb out of his ass and <laughs> takes enough time to look around and realize that he needs to put his money where his mouth is, if he joined and brought his followers you know, to help you on an issue, that you would be focused on the issue and not on past grievances. And that says a lot about you and where your priorities are and the kind of person you are. So I just wanted to say that um, I totally support you in the face of what he did. And I mean, I always support you because you yeah. do great work. But <laughs> I just want to say I'm standing next to you um, and because you did not deserve that at all, especially given um, what the tone of your question was aiming to do, which was to bring people together. And he tried to basically slap you in the face with his words. Mm, well, yes, but thank you. Thank you much. Um, I did want to sort of talk, you know, you've given me an opportunity to sort of talk about a little bit this idea of charity versus people who, who work and show up day after day after day to do the work. Like a charity drive is a great thing. You know, it's good to have this sort of lump sum of money, but people, whatever that his charities went for, there are people who have to take that money and manage it and implement it and there's staff that have to work with that and make sure that it gets where it's going and people are being helped. You know, so uh, if you give money to a shelter, there are people who work at the shelter, there are people who um, manage the shelter, you know, so all these sort of, and, and those are two ends of, of the same coin. So the idea that you would bring nothing to the table when what you're bringing is hard work and experience and knowledge, you know, all that really matters is the money. Like, I'm not sure where the disconnect there and what he thinks happens to the money after, you know, it's, it's raised and it leaves, if it just floats away and gets where it's supposed to go or, or what he thinks is going on. But it, it seemed very strange to me. Well, I was just going to uh, say, uh, I, I tried to rudely interrupt Krista, the, mm. the idea of an uneducated, ignorant man taking on a woman that, who has potentially decades of experience in the field is very much a microcosm of the presidential race itself. Yeah, <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but yeah, it's just... Um, uh, and I don't want to make this group about you know, spiting PJ. So I don't want to focus on it too much. It, I believe my guess, see, you know, he had talked earlier about how in the entire time that he's been making points about feminism, he could count on two hands, the number of people who sort of come back and, and argued against him. And I happened to be one of those people. Um, and he saw my video and then he just, you know, uh, I think he put it on his Facebook out to his followers or may have tweeted it out, you know, oh, this is boring. This is so boring. You can go watch this, but it's really boring. It's wasting your he, life to yeah, watch he this. Did, he did the same with my Descent of Manosphere video. It's a very common tactic. It's basically trying to flood it with hate. Yeah. And that's, you know, kind of what happened, but it, it, which is fine. I've been dogpiled by the best of them and I, you've been dogpiled by even more, but, um, it was, it's kind of like for him to say and to complain that people aren't taking his arguments seriously when on the occasions that they do, and prior to him actually coming out and saying on some video at some point, I can't remember what one, like, I have these points about feminism. I never would have known because I don't watch him. 
you know, he's just not my cup of tea. Uh, it, and I always thought he was strictly sort of an entertainer and a joker and those things. It never would have occurred to me to go looking to him for arguments. So it wasn't until he sort of announced that he had some that I even had the idea that responding to him would be something that would be even a concept. So um, I did. He says it's boring. But I mean, how is this a rational way of, and this goes, I think, to Philip Moriarty's question where he says, you know, how do you reconcile this with your supposed worldview? And, and they say, well, or well, TJ said, well, what does asking evidence for claims have to do with anything? But being a rational, reasonable, skeptical person is a lot more than just asking for claims. It's a whole mindset. It's a worldview. It's a way of looking at problems. It's a way of, of looking at things so that if people come to you and challenge your ideas and the best that you have to say is, eh, it's boring, boring, you know, don't expect them to come back twice. Why would they? But yet here, you know, after he said this boring thing, I've had no interactions with him whatsoever. So it really took me by surprise that, you know, he's like, uh, put your wallet away and shut the fuck up, bitch. And, or give me your, take out your wallet, give me money and shut the fuck up, bitch. Or whatever it was he said. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm doing that from memory. I think it was, um, <laughs> shut your mouth and open your wallet. Yeah, something like that. Um, for him to sort of be like that, it demonstrated maybe he's a little more sensitive than he's letting on. Because I, otherwise, I honestly can't imagine, like, why somebody would say, oh, would you like to work with me on something? Look, bitch, you know, like, that's not, I, I don't understand that response outside of that. That's my only guess, you know. Can I but, ask you what you think? If you were hoping for responses to your two questions that we've discussed, what mm. what would have been your hope for you know someone who made a, a sincere effort to engage with your question as it was meant to be put across? Uh, well, my first question, uh, you know, I did get that from many people, and I got just people who were just, yeah, I, I really would love to work with you. I'm interested in working with you. I'm interested in learning, you know, more about your experiences. You know, there was a lot of uh, very genuine people coming forward and being all for it and thinking it's a great idea. So as far as the Muslim question, I, I think I wanted, um, sort of, I, I guess, a reflection on, I think that the atheist community, the atheist movement that doesn't want to say it's a movement or a community, but still sort of exists, so there it is, um, is going to find itself having feminism's problems if they ever get big enough to be annoying to anybody in power, that is. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, Valerie Solanus has been dead for decades and I still hear about her and I'm sure you guys do too. Um, and, or we'll have, oh, what about kill all men? What about this? What about that? So when you have a movement that's where people are doing things that aren't good, it's still going to taint you even if you had nothing to do with it. Like I can't go back in time and help out Valerie Solanus and give her modern, you know, psychiatric drugs. And I can't go and tell the people from three years ago that maybe the kill all men joke wasn't that funny and it wasn't such a good idea and it could be taken really badly. You know, it's, it's just one of those, it's one of those things, you know, so if they really want to sort of bridge out the atheist movement right now is and i don't call myself an atheist um but right now it's a very small demographic and it's a very specific demographic and they haven't been able to sort of bridge the gaps that they would need to to bridge in order to be more interesting to people who are outside their demographic i don't know if you agree with what i'm saying and i think that to me you know god they had 
all of the right things in place where they really could have. Like, they have a scientific mindset. They understand how these work. They could have looked into social sciences and really just gotten a great plan together. They could have, they had all the pieces. They had the money. They had the, you know, the stage, the platform. They really could have gone out and done this the right way. And instead, by being sort of, social science denialists and by falling in on their own various bigotries or denying that they even exist, they've sort of just, they've bubbled themselves off into this very hard little group and they don't even seem to see it. And it, it may seem that I'm rambling, but this is something that sort of frustrates me. I, I tend to look from the outside and to sort of look at things this way and say, God, I really, it's, Secularism is such an important movement today, above all other things. Like, if we could really get out from underneath these rather unhelpful uh, religious ideas or really conservative religion, religious ideas, really fundamentalist religious ideas, boy, wouldn't that be great for the world? <laughs> you know, wouldn't that help? Uh, but we're not going to do that if we're going to refuse to talk to people and we're going to not think about how to talk to people or how to make sure that our message gets across. If we're just going to say, well, this is, we're shitlords. Huh? So you're just going to have to be, you and your stupid feels are just going to have to go away. Like, well, yeah, me, my stupid feels and everybody else who has human feelings you know, what is the game plan here? So that's what I keep going back. What's the plan? What are you trying to accomplish? And think about it. Think about if you're going to be trying to accomplish something, what would be the right way to do it? Yeah, if I could just jump in on that. Um, there's a lot in there to unpack and a lot that I agree with. Completely, and I followed you and it was great. And so I'm just going to ramble for a bit. And if I go off on a tangent and get lost, then I'm sorry. But there's so much to unpack here in terms of the atheist movement, and I think you've really put your finger on something. Um, and, but I would, I would distinguish between the online atheist YouTube movement in particular and real life atheism, mm. because I think there are both depressing signs and hopeful signs in the real life atheist movement in the U.S. The depressing signs are that um, we still have a situation where in atheist groups or whatever else, you know, when people meet up to um, discuss secular issues, you know, like meetups around the country, a lot of those have been historically dominated by white guys. And they're usually, you know, um, in a situation where they're, they don't necessarily have kids or they have someone who can watch the kids. And so they put the meetings at sort of unsociable times for families. And when they people get up, get there, they're the very male dominated spaces. And so atheism wants to branch out, you know, and not look around a room and have everybody look like you, but think half the population are women, where are women atheists? Um, how can we make our, our meetings a place where more people want to come? How can we bring in people who are uh, no, uh, black Americans who have a different experience? What about people from Hispanic backgrounds? Um, how is mm. the process of you know, dealing with atheism different as dealing with a, a Protestant family or a Mormon family or a Jehovah's Witness family? You know, what mm -hmm. can we do to support people who want to get out of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Because it's really more complicated than you know a lot of people's Catholic experience or Protestant experiences. Um, so in the real life, atheism movement, we have these, pro these problem areas, but we also have, I think, in the sort of um, the leadership people, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity to those kinds of issues and being more inclusive, as we saw in the Reason Rally. We also mm -hmm. have women, especially, you know, I, that's something I pay more attention to, but also people of color um, who are secular working to um, have their own conferences in order to find people and bring speakers out and get more people aware, as well as more representation at, at conferences. But we do need a conscious effort to make that happen. And what happens on YouTube atheism, if that's people's first encounter with atheism, wow, right. are a lot of people not going to feel welcome? And that's going to stop, as you point out, the movement towards secularism, which is our ultimate game, game in, or aim in that we want to make sure that um, people are treated fairly and that the government doesn't try to use its power or authority to impose religious beliefs on anyone. Right. And yeah, you're getting in our own way. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was it. That's what I wanted to say. So that, to me, the atheist, atheists are sort of the cavalry, right? When it comes to these secular issues, which are happening, still happening all over the country. I think the YouTube atheists think they kicked the religious people off of YouTube, so they won. You didn't. <laughs> it's they just moved a little bit and because they've been doing this a while right so you know you still have a lot of problems and there's nothing to say you know people have been declaring that they won over that god has been dead since life put out that thing 50 years ago 60 years ago whatever it was you know god is dead on the cover well no he he keeps coming back so um maybe he is that just that reincarnating goodness um but it's just this so atheism to me has always been about the ones at the very the cavalry like i call them the, the ones right on the tip because even though the atheists is a very small group within sort of these non-religious people you know the nuns as they're called which is something more like around 20 percent now i think um and you would probably know better than me yeah that's about right yeah so that's a you know that's a sizable group but within that like something like only three percent of that 20 percent is atheist or yeah, you know small amount yeah, yeah. um six percent i think i've seen yeah so they're not going they're not getting even the non-religious people on board <laughs> as much as they could be, which would make them much more of a, a force to be reckoned with. Um, and in order to do that, they have to be able to think 10 years in the future. They have to be able to think about how they're doing things and, and how they're uh, structuring their movement and how they're sort of selling it to people. And if they think that just uh, being shitlords is going to, do it it isn't because you know other than us you know other shit lords it's not that impressive to people it really isn't it does not impress adult people mature people people of real concerns you know when i look at women in religion they're doing a lot of the work right they're the people who um run the bake sales and clean up after everybody and they run the the sunday schools and they do all the sort of little tasks they just keep the whole thing running and they do it because of their communities they do it because of their families they do it because of their children much more in my experience anyway than they do because they're so they just love god that much it's it's much more that's what you're sort of raised in these religious groups that that's your role that's what you should do so they're not if you can't interact with these people if you can't talk to people on their ground then you're not going to to get them over you know um and i think also with the black community the historical significance of the church and the black community is something that you can't just uh, you know oh it doesn't matter yes it matters very much you know, and when you have this history of the church is the place where people come together and bond together so they can fight against their oppression, when you have some white guy saying, oh, no, 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 come join us now, by the way, we're assholes, uh, <laughs> you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, we are, we're dicks. Um, and we're going to call you these names and we're going to treat you like some sort of big whiny baby if you don't like it. I don't know. I, I just, it's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. I would say that you have to bring it back to your point about the label of um, you know, being like feminism. I mean, there was a, I recently like heard a couple of the podcasts from Eli Bosnick who I've learned as an amazing like social justice advocate. And he had a couple of interesting interviews. One of the ones that he said he was, um, he knows a woman, I think he said she was a black woman. And they talked about her not really believing in God and stuff, but she did identify as an atheist. And he asked, you know, well, why, you know, what, why is that? And her response was, well, if I did, look who would represent me. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's when he realized, right, we've got a problem. <laughs> we've got to make sure that people feel included. And right now there isn't that feeling of inclusion. If it's basically, if you don't see the world through the eyes of me, you know, the dominant sort of voice here, which tends to be straight white men, um, then you know, you're complaining or your views are invalid or you're a social justice warrior, whatever else. And we're right. not going to get beyond that 6%, like you said, if that's the face of atheism. <sighs> Kevin, did we lose you? No, so I just thought it would be a little bit on the nose for a straight white man to dominate, <laughs> white man to dominate discussion. I thought that would be too <laughs> that, that would be like privilege inception or something. <laughs> But, but you know, I, I agree generally with what the points that were being made for what it's worth. <laughs> and intersectionality, you know, intersectionality again being important because, like, with men standing up saying, "Look, Trump doesn't speak for me," you know, it's also important to have white, straight males saying, "You know, these people don't speak for me either." If nothing else, just to stand in solidarity with everybody else, going, "That's really not all we are. That's yeah. not all what we are." Well, yeah, and not just that, but I mean, in the, the idea that it's locker talk, you know, to the, the Trump defense. Well, I've been in locker rooms and, and I've, I've been in male only spaces and things. And outside of some very rare exceptions, most people don't talk in that way. They certainly don't speak for me and the people I know. Mm. So we've now been waiting 25 minutes for Tom. Yeah, Tom, come on. <laughs> Tom, you better have lost a leg or something. <laughs> I, I think the message came in at 12 minutes after and about 39 after now and he said 20 minutes then so I would yeah. say what do you want to give it like another 10 minutes or so of chatting otherwise it's like getting well 20 to midnight I could keep going I guess but um well I, I have to yes. get going pretty soon anyway but yeah to, I'll stick around 10 minutes that's cool but that's all right but uh, then we'll need a new topic. Um, so did you want to give maybe one of your other reactions to the comment and uh, reactions to some of the other questions um, that were asked? Uh, uh, that um, well, one thing is um, H bomber guy. Um, he uh, asked some questions that were obviously meant in a sort of joking way, a satirical way, perhaps. Um, and I just noticed that the just a jokesters lost their humor really fast when the joke was on them. Uh, just like immediately, they're like, oh, that's not funny. Like, I thought it was funny. Like, I know you, I don't find bearing funny, and some people do. Just, just a thought. Yeah, and it also seemed to be a way to deflect his, from his questions. I mean, his, one other, his question about, you know, if there are real problems out there, why aren't you talking about the real problems and just let the feminists get on with whatever they're talking about, as opposed to just whining about it forever? Mm. You do a lot of, uh, of humor, Kevin. Do you find that people take your humor very well? <laughs> um, it depends. It depends if it's, if it's aimed at them. No. Um... <laughs> But that's sort of the point. Um, yeah. No, I've, the one thing I found is that people who would already have taken you out of context had you been talking seriously will do so with comedy as well. If they want to be, if they want to feign offence or to claim that you're some sort of a hideous monster, they'll do so. So it sort of doesn't matter whether you're talking seriously or being sarcastic or whatever. Mm. Yeah, but um, what about the response in general? Um, we certainly got um, a, a big response. Uh, do, you th like, do you see one positive thing come out of it? Do you think um, people, some people at least, seem to um, think about things differently in your experience of looking over the responses and the comments and things? Hmm. Different? <laughs> uh... <sighs> mm. Well, I think that that would be a tall order for questions. Um, but I do, I did see uh, certainly some people that were interested in having a dialogue. So I think that's very positive. And I saw people that were 
uh, I saw a lot of people that assumed that we would never touch on these subjects. We would never look at the responses um, and that certainly Steve Shives would never look in the responses and never do anything. So I think it, it was positive that we sort of took them seriously enough to sort of read through them. I, co I commented a, on a lot of people's, um, you know, whenever I watched something, I would throw in a little comment like, oh, hey, great, you know, thanks for doing this or whatever, just to let them know that I was around, that people were taking them seriously, people were taking the time. Um, if you answer the questions, yeah, I'll, I'll come over and I'll look at what you had to say, um, unless you're immediately horrifically obnoxious, which some people were, which, you know, I'm not going to subject myself that to that endlessly, but, you know, for the most part, people were pretty okay about it, so. Yeah, I think the thing to bear in mind is that it's almost, well, not almost, it is impossible to really judge whether this has been a successful endeavor or not, because ultimately, like a lot of educational activism, for want of a better phrase, a slightly less absurd phrase, um, it's uh, when you talk about whether people think about things differently or look at things differently, it's impossible to know unless you're inside that person's head. So essentially, mm -hmm. if, if we've planted a few seeds in a few minds and maybe it, the, at the very least made people less extreme in their opposition toward feminism or social justice or whatever, mm -hmm. then I think that's, that would have been a, a great thing all, all round, a worthwhile endeavor, you know? Yeah, at least to see us as, as, oh, I know those people. I know those guys. You know, they're yeah. not, they don't have horns coming out of their head and like, flames coming out of their ears. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I've noticed that. Like when um, I've talked with, you know, people like Sargon or whoever, just instantly, just having that human to human connection instantly breaks down a lot of the barrier. Mm. You, you, can't, you can't demonize someone that you know isn't a demon. Right. Unless you're bearing telling him to shut up. <laughs> True, but I got to tell him to go fuck himself uh, on a live stream, so I mean, I'm happy with that. Mm. Uh, that sounds like, yeah, you guys broke even. Hey, Tom, how are you? Look I'm, who I'm finally here. shows up. I'm sorry, <laughs> man. I. <laughs> I had, I had like, you know, I was running errands and I hit like every red light. So, I'm, I mean, I'm here now, uh, yeah, I we're guess. Yeah, like a warm-up band that kept had to keep going out for encores, encores, um, to, before the main uh, event came on. So, but now you're mm -hmm. here. 